This is the moment you've all been waiting for. We are going to see and hear about the new pitches. So, we just got to hear from the network action teams that were developed out of the pitches in 2020 and 2021. And we're now going to hear the four new pitches that are coming before you today. How this is gonna work, we're doing this the same way we did last year. We had the pitchers create videos about their pitch proposals, five minute videos. So what we're gonna do is we're going to hear two of those videos and then we will ask some folks who were involved in bringing that concept to us to come forward and answer your questions. Then we'll do the same for the second two, another Q&A session. And then we're gonna give you a little bit of time to think about the pitches, talk with people at your tables, think about how well they meet the criteria, and then we will do the first round of voting on which ones we think we would like to see made into network action teams for the coming year. So I just wanna remind you um, of our pitch criteria. This is all on page three of your packet. There's actually a lot of information there about the pitch process and what it is that we're trying to do with these pitches. And on pages four and five, there's a really brief overview of the four pitches that you're gonna see a video about with some space for you to make notes if that's helpful to you as you're thinking them through. And we will, once again, be using the Slido Q&A function. So you can put your questions in about the two pitches that you see, and then we'll vote those up and, and answer those questions. All right. Is everyone ready? Our first pitch, oh, we don't need that. Our first pitch is on tenant weatherization. My name is Tom Proctor and I'm the housing justice organizer for Rights and Democracy. I'm presenting our pitch on behalf of RAD, Middlebury College, the Conservation Law Foundation, and the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. My work with RAD has placed me in the front row of an escalating crisis in Vermont, directly affecting a near third of state residents who rent their homes. A crisis that, if left to continue, will affect every single one of us in the near future. Our proposal will provide much needed financial respite for thousands of working people and contribute to huge gains in weatherization across Vermont. Before we get to our proposal, I would like to lay out what the rental market currently looks like and how market conditions have changed in the last few years. Rental units make up 80,000 homes in Vermont, accounting for 29% of all permanently occupied homes, or roughly 181,000 people. In the last 30 years, the growth of available homes has plummeted, a lack of availability that has been compounded by pandemic and climate migration. In 2021, for the first time in decades, Vermont saw a net increase in new residents. In short, we do not have enough available houses, we're not creating enough new housing, and the demand is only getting higher. This has been reflected in an explosion in house prices, with a staggering 16% increase in the sale price of a single-family home in the last year, set to rise again this year by another 5.2%. The knock-on effect of this increase is a bump in property valuation, which in turn has meant higher property taxes for homeowners. A lack of housing combined with a tax increase has incentivized landlords to pass the financial burdens to their tenants. In 2019, 51% of Vermont tenants spent over 30% of their income on rent the standard for assessing affordability. While current figures are unknown, it is unquestionable that this percentage has only gone higher in the last three years. It's clear that the cost of housing has put pressure on other areas of our economy. When 30% of the state spend the vast majority of their income on shelter, it leaves little room to spend on leisure, entertainment and education, and curtails spending on basic necessities like food and fuel. Vermont's housing stock is old, drafty and in desperate need of mass weatherization. The issue is exacerbated with rental stock. As landlords seldom bear the burden of paying unit utility bills, they have little incentive to spend their money to modernize their units. This leaves their tenants with a crippling choice of spending money they don't have to heat their homes or to live in inhospitable conditions. The choice of many will be the latter, and in the coming years, more will be forced to take that step as energy costs continue to rise. In the summertime, we have no way to dehumidify our place. It is always damp, which causes us to have food loss. We put a bag of bagels in our cabinet, and within two days without being open, it's covered in mold. We do not feel confident bringing any of our housing issues to our landlord. We do 
fear uh, that he'll retaliate. We have very little left over at the end of each mm -hmm. month. Um, we have relied on things like the food shelf in the past. Last year, I was paying 700, I believe, and I just re-signed my lease for the same apartment and they're increasing my rent to around 900 now, um, starting next year. <laughs> I've had some issues with uh, a landlord. My heat didn't work um, in the winter and he didn't do anything until, I wanna say about February. Um, and there was kind of nothing we could do about it. We don't own that place. So I think we only bring issues to our landlords when it's like severe, there's nothing else we can do. Um, yeah, I just don't want to upset them because they control my living situation. And if they decide they don't want me there, they can. <laughs> In my last apartment, one of my bedroom windows had a sheet of ice um, through the winter on the inside. The heat wasn't actually working for several weeks. It was really, really bad. I had to wear multiple pairs of sweatpants to bed. Yeah, at one point the pipes just burst because it was so freezing in my apartment. During the months of like January to May, probably half of what I make goes to rent and heating. I kind of cut corners wherever I can. I eat cheaply. I don't go out. I'm always thinking about like making rent, but I mean, I know I'm certainly not alone. I know that everyone else is kind of struggling just as hard as I am. Our pitch is to research and develop policies that would require landlords to weatherize their units or reduce energy costs in other ways for their tenants, such as installing heat pumps and solar panels. The policies we'll develop will include state initiatives, regulations to cap tenant utility costs, and other solutions that have been effective for rental unit weatherization in other states. As part of the policy research period, we'll be partnering with Middlebury College, who will assist by examining and learning from comparable initiatives utilized in other states and around the world. The purpose of our policy is twofold, to lower greenhouse gas emissions from Vermont residences through weatherization and to reduce the financial burden of utility bills for tenants. Vermont is unable to utilize current weatherization initiatives as they don't own their own homes and are already suffering from the brutal and unchecked rental industry. Thank you for your consideration. Together, we can work towards our collective climate goals and create an equitable climate solution. Thanks for joining us in reimagining community resilience hubs in rural Vermont. With an unprecedented amount of investment at the federal and state levels earmarked for an equitable energy transition, it's really important we assess successful models for implementation to ensure that these investments produce sustainable community level results. The concept of the resilience hub sits at the nexus of community and energy resilience, emergency management, climate change mitigation, and social equity, while providing opportunities for communities to be successful before, during, and after disruptions. We believe adapting this model for our rural communities has the potential to augment existing centers, think libraries, community farms, town complexes, to reduce energy burdens, reduce fossil fuel use and greenhouse gas pollution, complement existing emergency management, and more. We know that Vermonters can come together during catastrophes such as hurricanes and COVID. Local champions step up and they meet the needs as they arise from community members, ecosystems, and infrastructure. We see increasing impacts of climate change. And we note that this reactionary cycle of the efforts result in delayed deployment, burnout, and lack of access to basic needs. But a resilient community has this built capacity for responding to everyday conditions and is also able to adapt and provide not only basic needs, but opportunities to thrive. Many of our communities across our rural state lack a central hub to formalize community and external assets, including services, investment, volunteer, and professional support. Renewed efforts across the state are focusing on reducing energy burdens, access to heating and cooling, broadband, healthy and affordable food, transportation options, and reliable, well-compensated work. All of these efforts will increasingly depend on clean, reliable, affordable energy. And access to services and the financial, social, environmental benefits of clean and resilient energy at the community level is essential. The Urban Sustainability Directors Network has developed a resilience hub model which uses a physical space to focus investment and a community process to lead it. This model leverages pre-existing and community-managed facilities that provide year-round services and expands them to help coordinate resource distribution, services, and communication and provide technical assistance to reduce carbon pollution, enhance quality of life, and strengthen energy and community resilience. 
Core components of resilience hubs are also the main categories where upgrades to existing community facilities are often needed. One we often don't see, but really need, is the resilient power, reliable backup power to the facility during a hazard, while also improving cost effectiveness and sustainability of operations in all three operating modes. Resilience hubs serve communities in three modes or operating conditions. Every day, where their primary focus is community services, programming, and relationship building. During a disruption, where they're able to amp up and augment their services to provide backup and complementary emergency management and throughout recovery. The Resilient Hub model not only supports broader state goals towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions, improving communication and emergency response, and strengthening local economies via workforce development, but it critically addresses the disproportionate impacts of systemic inequities, natural disasters, and climate change on frontline communities. Our pitch focuses on how to adapt the successful model of urban resilience to our rural communities. We plan to bring together a working group of diverse team members to review existing research and community-centered approaches to community and rural energy resilience, and then co-develop what a resiliency hub element should be with existing community-based organizations. A main component of the proposed pitch is to work collaboratively with overstretched and under-resourced community members. We plan to utilize the award money towards community engagement strategies, such as offering translation, childcare, food, and or stipends for participation. The ultimate goal is to set the foundation for two pilot community resilience hubs through broad community engagement that develops clear priorities. And we see this community co-development as a replicable but iterative process. By centering these conversations around those most affected by climate and energy injustice, the first year of this project will focus initially on two communities, one in Orleans County and one in Washington County. Vermont's most rural communities carry the highest energy burden. 12 communities have energy burdens of 15% and above, most of which are in the Northeast Kingdom, including Orleans County, with the major exception of Barry City in Washington County, which ranks in the 10 highest burden towns in the state across all three sectors, electricity, thermal, and transportation. As established in recently passed Act 154 on Environmental Justice and the 2019 Vermont Energy Burden Report, BIPOC, low-income, and rural Vermonters have largely been left out from major economic, social, and environmental benefits associated with investments in climate resilience and renewable energy infrastructure. BIPOC Vermonters were seven times more likely to have gone without heat in the past year, over two times more likely to have had difficulty affording electricity, and seven times less likely to own solar panels than white Vermonters, while rural communities consistently carry the highest energy burden. We're not starting from scratch by any means. We are looking to focus investment that is traditionally happening on an ad hoc basis and or fragmented between different governmental, professional, volunteer, and nonprofit efforts onto pre-existing community embedded facilities to expand and support their efforts while addressing energy infrastructure intentionally. We have a broad pool of expertise and interested parties with which to move forward. We can move the implementation needle with climate solutions that work because they are designed by and for the communities that they serve. We can expect far-reaching return on investments both within a given community and across the state as the model is put into practice, iterated, and innovated in the years to come. Thank you for your consideration. We hope you support our efforts to reduce local energy burdens and greenhouse gas emissions, strengthen community and energy resilience, and shift power to communities. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, I would like to invite Tom and Dan up to the stage for the weatherization tenant protection proposal and Sam and Laura for community led resilience hubs. And we will ask them some questions. Okay, so our first question is for our tenant weatherization pitch. And the question is could the tenant weatherization pitch be incorporated in, into and leverage the current weatherization scale group? Hi, yeah, um, so Tom Proctor from the video. Um, I would very much, uh, part of our plan would be very much to fold in these two groups together um, with the weatherization at scale model that is being put out there. Uh, there are some fantastic ideas, there is some fantastic initiatives that have been put forward, and we would very much like to use those initiatives within the tenant weatherization uh, policy that we'd, we'd create but it's very important that there is also tenant landlord specific policy as well. So we would be cooperating in some ways, but as uh, tenants don't have the power to put in weatherization, um, or put weatherization in their own homes or utilize those grants, uh, we're gonna have to come up with specific policy that's going to incentivize landlords to do so. 
And I would just add, I think, you know, when we started this pitch and where it got its first title was months ago, around weatherization, but as we think broader about the topic and think about heat pumps, which would be part of the clean heat pe folks, think about solar, think about all the different ways that we can actually both make it more energy efficient and reduce tenant costs. It goes beyond the weatherization at scale group, but I think there's a lot of different groups that we'd be able to work with. Thank you. Um, for the community hubs, um, Jacob says, this makes me think of local schools. Is there a synergy between schools and your idea? Can hear me? Yes, definitely. Schools are a wonderful opportunity that's a community-based um, asset already, and so would be a part of the conversations as to the union district or whatever is the overarching um, supervisory union, whether they're open to that. Because also, as we start to see the impacts of climate shifting, they could be a great opportunity for cooling centers. Um, both for the school year, but then also within the summer months when they're underutilized. Absolutely, and I think the conscious thing we were um, thinking about when we were at the pre-pitch summit and had members um, who were representing schools, you know, in that conversation was um, was to make sure that we also don't automatically assume that they don't have enough to do already. <laughs> I'm sure that is the case for everybody, but oftentimes it is a, a really convenient space. So absolutely, keeping them part of the group, part of the conversation. But also looking at, you know, local libraries provide a ton of services, everything from CPR courses to upper child care to providing internet access and computers to many residents who don't have them. And so where are those places naturally happening as well that do a lot of work with schools already too? So absolutely it's that kind of let's focus on those connections where people already are um, and bring everybody together and focus investment there. And I think that investment piece is also another thing that's a little bit complicated with schools. Um, just because funding streams tend to be earmarked uh, differently for school districts, and I think that's just kind of a logistical piece that we're not saying is a huge barrier, but is something to consider. Okay, question for you guys. Um, how would the tenant weatherization project lead to different outcomes, given that existing tenant protections, including space heating requirements, go largely unenforced? Yeah, this is a really great question, and just so everyone knows, I'm a housing justice organizer at Rights and Democracy rather than climate organizer. Um, the problems we have with rental properties and tenants uh, in Vermont right now are many. Uh, one of the big, big ones right now is we, we can't track things like this, and code enforcement is inadequate. So as part of this policy proposal, we will be looking at various policies that will allow uh, the state to be able to figure out which houses are not weatherized and which ones are so we can actually have a proper enforcement method. At the moment it's a little bit like the Wild West out there um, and tenants are really suffering for it. So there's not going to be one policy that's a silver bullet that's going to fix the housing crisis or weatherization or in, 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 in rental units but there is going to have to be several different policies. Um, what we're going to be doing is looking into what policies will actually make the difference and add into that a code enforcement. All right. Okay, for you two. What makes the community resilience hubs different from the community resiliency organizations or CROWs already in existence in Vermont, if you know about those organizations? I think we would absolutely uh, be looking to uh, invite crows to the table, um, or actually let's be asked for a seat at their table, <laughs> given the longevity of, um, and tremendous work that they've done throughout our state. I think um, this is uh, not necessarily different, it has an emphasis on looking at um, how we can stack the funding that is sort of very, very new coming down right now, both at a federal and state level, stack that into a physical place. Um, and then utilize um, CROWs and other organizations who are already working with communities. So basically be to support organizations like CROWs in physical places. So I think it's just kind of another level and, and like an overlay um, that's gonna help sort of bring uh, uh, sustainability, I guess if you, if you could say, uh, to those efforts. Um, we're seeing a, you know, a lot of different uh, groups over time um, form these wonderful relationships and we just wanna make sure that there is the funding in place um, to invest in that space, does that make sense? I hope that answers the question, but I'm happy to continue. All right. 
how will a rental property be determined to be unweatherized? I, I mean, we, I think energy audits are gonna be a big part of it, but we decide all the time in weatherization what needs to be done and, and how much work needs to be done on homes and it can be the same for rental units. And so getting a good uh, landscape of where rentals are at, how much work they need to be done is gonna be a baseline that we're gonna have to come to. And again, we're gonna try to create like, you know, somebody I think also asked about carrots and sticks. We're gonna try to create some carrots so that landlords wanna do this. And I think there are good landlords that will wanna do this work when they know that they have the assistance to do it. But we also wanna create enforcement so that way, you know, landlords who are less proactive also have to do it so tenants don't suffer. I'd also like to say there is other models around the country as well. Boulder, Colorado is, is, a, is a community that has got this uh, tenant weatherization protection policy in place. Um, and you know they came up with a standard of what is considered weatherized. They also came up with an idea that there would be a gradual on-ramp. This is not something that we want to implement in the next year, two years. For every single landlord, that's impractical. We don't have to work for um, it's, we don't want this to be punitive, we actually want this to be good for landlords and tenants. And so it's going to be imperative that we do have a lot of carrots, but eventually sometimes you need to have that, that incentive as well that's it's going to push a few of those landlords that have been reluctant so far. But we really want to be able to sell them first on the fact that if they do weatherize their units and their apartments and their investment properties, those properties probably will become more valuable. So let's, we'll start out with being nicey-nice and then see how it goes from there. Another question for you. Uh, mobile home parks are a blend between home ownership and rental units, as most pay a lot rents. Will the tenant weatherization project include mobile home parks? Yes. Excellent. That was easy. Okay. How will the Resilience Hub planning and engagement coordinate with the state's update to the hazard mitigation plan, which also includes engagement goals? So a quick pitch in terms of what we've heard today in a lot of these other sessions has been how do we engage It's part of a lot, how do we engage with communities? And so this is a level one pitch, which would be looking at existing um, ways that different organizations and state entities are engaging currently um, and doing an assessment of what other places are doing this equitable engagement and what are some of those tools that we can also bring to the table. Yeah, absolutely, definitely speaking to, so the, the question is specifically on local hazard mitigation plans, is that right? Yes. Yes, all right. Thank you. Coordination or plan? Planning and, okay. That's okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to wing it. All right. Engagement. It's engagement. It's specifically engagement. Okay. So I, I'll just say that I should start with introducing myself. Apologize. Sam Lash, she is, and I um, work at the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, and um, I'm very much involved with local hazard mitigation planning on a town-to-town -town basis, actually. Um, and I think it's wonderful that the new policy updates include an increased focus on, on climate change and considering the effects of climate change on populations at a five to ten year level of looking at mitigation. Um, and then also um, vulnerable populations. And so I think a lot of that work, um, a lot of that increased focus does require community engagement and, and you know, being the person on the ground and doing that in several towns right now across the region. Um, you know, we keep inviting uh, community members into quote unquote our space or a town space um, and we try, I would say that there's a, first of all, there's a, oftentimes a, well everybody gathers here but there's not necessarily enough space for everybody and or it's being used um, for you know another group and or it doesn't have heat right now so can we do this in the spring and or that kind of thing. So actually what we're trying to do, focus is, is how do we focus um, to ensure that those spaces are large enough to serve the whole community, have clean and resilient power. That's kind of the whole point of the, of the model. Um, and so I think it would, they would absolutely go hand in hand together. Um, and I think that there is an increase at, in terms of the Department of Health has heating and or hot weather preparedness um, engagement going on right now. You have um, health equity going on right now. You have a lot of different um, groups who are sort of looking at bits and pieces of this. And this is like, how do we focus them all together so we can actually leverage them on the ground and all of the programs that are sort of targeting really the same group of a few um, local champions are, are not, you know, how are we not going to burn out on any one of those really important initiatives? All right. Has t the tenant weatherization group considered including a rental property efficiency labeling requirement to also create some market forces for efficiency investment? 
I mean, I think the short answer is we've thought about it a little bit. Same with green contracting. Um, in other words, yeah. I mean, I think there's, I'll just say, because there's like a lot of different questions here, you know, current RAP funding and how it can be expanded. Um, this, this issue, FEMA money. There's so many great ideas here. There's so many potential solutions. There's already things that are being done in the state government that might already be fixes to some of it that people might not just know about. So we're really open-minded and hopefully the people, they're all anonymous, but hopefully the people that are writing this want to get involved with our work group, bring that knowledge and bring the curiosity on this issue to that work group. That was a perfect wrap. Okay, wrap on wrap. Okay, we are going to thank these folks for bringing their pitches and answering your questions. Yay. <laughs> and now we have two more, oh, sorry, one more set of two pitches that we're going to watch the videos for. It's 2030, and Vermont has reached a major climate benchmark. We've weatherized and electrified thousands of homes. We've added new housing, but we've cut emissions from buildings dramatically. How did we do it? Back in 2022, we introduced network geothermal systems, quickly generating demand and paving the way for taking this exciting solution to scale. Now village centers are connected to geothermal loops, sharing energy among libraries, schools, stores, and homes. Residents in affordable housing can pay their low energy bills and have safer, healthier indoor air. Vermont farms offer highly efficient housing for workers with ground source heat pumps linked to underground pipes, providing warmth in winter and cooling in summer. Mobile home neighborhoods have paired network geothermal with community solar, keeping costs low and canceling emissions. Smart growth developments are smarter, safer, and more resilient now that thermal loops replace gas pipelines and oil and propane tanks. Former fossil fuel workers are building these systems, earning family sustaining wages and benefiting from job security. Our vision is a successful energy transition, thanks in part to leveraging network geothermal for a non-emitting, safe, healthy, affordable future for everyone. We don't have to depend on electricity for everything or get stuck burning polluting fuels. We can heat and cool using the temperature under our feet. Underground, vertical pipes bring 55 degree water to horizontal pipes that loop between buildings and indoor ground source heat pumps. Homes and buildings share different thermal needs so energy is never wasted, but is exchanged or stored in the ground until it's needed. Designed to interconnect, these systems can grow over time, balancing the temperature of the water among different thermal sources and sinks, from hockey rinks to hospitals. These systems are already operational. Colorado Mesa University has relied on network thermal for 12 years and never once used its gas backup. In Toronto, 312 households have a projected 80% reduction in emissions from the network system and 100% from buildings. One Texas development is growing to include 7,500 homes, 2 million square feet of commercial space, and two schools on network geothermal. Projects are coming online in New York, Massachusetts, and DC with feasibility studies in Oregon, Minnesota, and Philadelphia. As a small state, we can move quickly to put network geothermal to work. In the next year, we'll engage local and state leaders, establish a resource bank of materials, collect data on potential locations, research innovative ownership models, initiate needed policy changes, and broadcast these solutions via events and media. We'll also launch the Vermont Community Geothermal Alliance, a new statewide network for information and planning. And we'll represent Vermont on the National Network Geothermal Coalition, hosted by Building Decarbonization Coalition. This first year will position us to develop projects and apply for a low interest federal loan to kickstart implementation. As a climate economist, I've delved deeply into energy costs and policies in several states. I'm joining this team because if it's done right, network geothermal systems can be made accessible and affordable to everyone, particularly low-income households. To end our reliance on fossil fuels, we need to diversify our energy technologies, reduce the distance between the sources and the people using the energy, and allow people to directly own and make decisions about the systems. We know geothermal can help us meet these challenges, 
Now we need to support shared learning across Vermont communities to make network geothermal a common practice. I'm ready to train our students in network geothermal engineering and construction. If I know there's demand and jobs, I can build the curriculum. We need to make sure workers and communities are put above profits. We can do this through green justice zones, which would require projects such as network geothermal to use union labor and high labor standards, in addition to centering BIPOC and low income communities. I've been representing citizens groups and native peoples against large hydro and fossil fuel projects since 1989. It has become clear to me that thermal energy networks are vastly preferable to fossil fuels and large hydro and can help us avoid substituting biofuels and other damaging new energy sources that may be as bad as the fossil fuels they replace. While we differ on some energy choices, we now have a shared purpose. VGS is responding to the intense demand for new housing that is both affordable and decarbonized. We've launched an internal task force to develop a new service to deploy network geothermal systems at scale. We agree that network geothermal is a powerful energy solution for many Vermont communities, starting with affordable housing and low-income neighborhoods. We're learning to do something different and putting resources behind it. We're small and agile enough to do it, and we hope people see us as a resource. Your vote for this project puts network geothermal on the table now and helps us all take a giant step toward meeting our climate goals by realizing the potential of this proven solution. We're moving forward. We hope you'll join us. Hi, I'm Jordan Giaconia, Public Policy Manager of Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. And today I'm excited to pitch you on how Vermont can utilize the Cap and Invest program to try to path toward a more affordable, reliable, and equitable clean transportation future. So as you all know, transportation is essential to economic development in Vermont and our overall way of life, but it remains our largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for roughly 40% of our state's total climate emissions. So what does that mean for our local communities? Well, first off, fossil fuel transportation is a significant drain on our economy. In 2020 alone, Vermonters spent more than $700 million on fossil fuels for transportation, and of that total, 72% left the state's economy. Meanwhile, 70% of electricity spending stays here in the Green Mountain State. Also, our current transportation system is inequitable. Low-income Vermonters spend a much higher share of their income on transportation fuels, especially those in rural areas. Meanwhile, people of color and those in low-income communities shoulder much more pollution from cars, buses, and trucks. So in short, decarbonizing Vermont's transportation sector is essential to creating a more equitable economy and reaching our state's emissions reductions requirements as codified by the Global Warming Solutions Act. There's no one-size-fits-all solution, but no matter what direction we take, it will take historic state and federal investment to bring our clean transportation future to fruition. The stalling of Vermont's other key transportation emissions reduction program, namely the, the Transportation Climate Initiative program, has made one thing abundantly clear. Without more transformative action, we will not meet our climate requirements. So what comes next? Our group would gather the necessary research and community input to lay the foundation for Vermont to either join an existing cap and invest program, such as one in California, Quebec, Nova Scotia, or Washington, take the lead on reinvigorating the TCIP, or create our own program. So let's hear more from our team members about the ins and outs of this exciting proposal. We need to center equity in our transportation policies and programs and opportunities. Why? Because especially in this inflationary time, low and moderate income communities, frontline communities, those most impacted by climate actually are impacted most by the costs of the current system. They can't financially switch to a new cleaner burning car. So we need to actually lay the groundwork by engaging these very impacted communities in the work we do through a meaningful engagement process. And we need to have sustainable investment year after year so that their needs can be prioritized in the programs we implement. Several new states and jurisdictions have developed or joined economy-wide cap and invest programs in recent years, such as Washington, Oregon, and Nova Scotia. This provides us an opportunity to learn why they chose the models they did and to determine what might be relevant for Vermont. For example, 
How have they addressed equity and environmental justice in program design and implementation? What are the specific features of programs, if any, that reach rural populations and other underserved communities? How do they address the impact of gas prices on disadvantaged communities? And what elements of their program design make sense for a small rural state like Vermont? We propose to use the answers to these questions to provide concrete information for policymakers and stakeholders to further our understanding of what makes sense for Vermont. I believe that the legislature has a pivotal role to play as directed by the Climate Action Plan to move forward a cap and invest program within our transportation sector. When I think about the new incoming class of elected leaders, both in the House and the Senate, we've got such an opportunity to make sure that we meet our climate emission goals. A few ways that we can make sure that happens within a cap and invest program are to do three things. The first is to make sure that the agency of natural resources has the resources that it needs to put forward a program like this. The second is to have a transportation equity board that looks at the framework that we can set up for a program like this. And last is to make sure that we have a greenhouse gas emissions reporting program so that we have that foundation to move forward on a program. I look forward to working with new and returning elected leaders under the Golden Dome and working alongside key stakeholders and the Energy Action Network. As businesses, advocates, and community leaders, we all recognize the promise of a clean transportation future when it comes to our economic vitality, climate impact, and community health. And with your support, we can provide key decision makers and the public with a compelling report on how cap and invest programs can bring that future to fruition. So together, let's mobilize our leaders in the administration and the Climate Council and the legislature to pursue cap and invest and ensure that our brave little state has the resources necessary to bring our transportation system into the 21st century. Thank you for your time and consideration. Welcome. Okay, our first question is for networked geothermal. And the question is, how much money is required for networked geothermal systems and how do these systems compare on a dollar per ton reduced metric relative to other clean heat options? Yeah, just push that up, okay. there you go. Uh, so I can start answering and then maybe Richard could jump in. First, I just wanna emphasize that what we have in this pitch is a, a parallel tandem effort of a community-based project that I am hoping to lead with other people and what VGS is doing. So there's gonna be a lot of information sharing and back and forth between the utility scale and the community scale. Now that said, both efforts face a lot of upfront capital costs. When these systems are in the, in the ground, the residents' bills are gonna be incredibly low. The project that's going in the ground in Massachusetts right now in Framingham, they're estimating $9 a month for heating and cooling in residential units. So the upfront capital cost is something we are going to have to address. Happily, the Department of Energy has low interest loans available right now, and those loans are in the billions of dollars total. So um, I'm gonna pass it to Richard and see if he'd like to add anything. Great, well there's, there's two components. My name's Richard, I'm from VGS, maybe one day known as Vermont Geothermal Systems or right now known as Vermont Gas Systems. Um, so uh, there's, you know, there's two components to the, these geothermal systems, right? There's the inside appliances and the distribution of the heating, heating and cooling in those systems. And those, are, those compare favorably with existing clean energy solutions in terms of the inside technologies that would go into people's homes and businesses. And then the second part is the expensive part, right? The extra cost of putting in the ground loops and uh, that kind of construction. It's, not, it's not inexpensive, it's very expensive. If you're looking at new construction, it's a little bit easier to build a model around that because you have a green field, you're not retrofitting buildings. So you have a good opportunity here with new construction, particularly on the residential side. There is a way to align investment with long-term uh, types of returns. So you, know, you can do that, utilities been doing that for years, is basically looking at what are those costs, how long is the system going to last, and what are the maintenance uh, on those on those investments to to make sure that they perform? So I think that's the key here is to find to match up the 
the systems with the type of investment that's needed to make this work. Thank you. All right. I just got rid of the question I was going to ask, but I think I remember it, which is, there are already two clean transportation network action teams. How would this group work with those other groups? Uh, well, a couple of pieces, I think is also like sort of what were the differences between those as well. And I think the key element of this, and, and this is a good carryover sort of segue from the previous uh, network action team that I was a part of, is there's sort of a unifying theme of all of our transportation needs and that, that, that they require significant upfront investment. So rather than looking at sort of cause and effect, we're primarily looking at a funding mechanism um, in particular to be able to continue to channel investments into critical areas, whether that's public transit, EV deployment, um, walking and biking infrastructure, you name it. So I see this as being complementary in the sense that the work of these other groups is great for case making in terms of pursuing cap and invest. Um, however, I think there's a marked difference between finding a suitable funding mechanism and developing a blueprint for the equitable investment of those funds compared to say very issue specific or location specific uh, clean transportation initiatives. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just say that the, the previous network action team actually informed this network action team. It defined where we are going to focus the emphasis of this network action team. So it's not that they are two different discussions, it's one that informed the next one. Thank you. Okay, network heat is a utility style service. Do you envision utility-style regulation to protect consumers, control rates, ensure access for all, et cetera? Thank you for that question. Um, my, I'd like to answer and then see what Richard, how he wants to answer this. This is an ongoing discussion right now. My answer is yes. Um, in order to be equitable, we need across-the-board rate setting for these systems. And we need to learn from what's happening in other states. In our presentation, there were many other states that were mentioned. There's a national coalition that right now includes 12 states, and we are representing Vermont there. So we're part of that and can learn from what's happening in other states. But yes, we need to talk about policy, we need to talk about rate setting, and we have an opportunity in Vermont to innovate and to do it equitably and to have others follow our example. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with anything that, that we just said um, at all. In fact, I, I think it's, it's super important to figure this out from a utility perspective. It's going to look different than na natural gas distribution. It's going to look different than a lot of things that we've seen because uh, this is a, new, a relatively new solution. This is the one really big innovation in geothermal in the past 30, 40, 50 years, you know, this kind of community loop type of style of design. And I, I think that, um, well, we know our customers want it, and we know we can do it as a utility. Particularly gas utilities have those core competencies to actually build underground long-term infrastructure with pipes. So we think this is a good way to, a good overlay of our business model. It's gonna look different from a regulatory standpoint, but it's something we can do, our customers want it, and we have to figure the business model out in, in the regulatory arena. Thank you. All right. If what are the differences and pros and cons between cap and invest for transportation and the low carbon fuel standard for transportation? If you feel like you can answer that question. That is a big question that requires a long answer, but I will say first and foremost that they are complementary. It's absolutely possible to have both. California has shown that you can have both. I would say one thing that cap and invest can do that is incredibly important given the conversations that we've had today. It is a proven policy that can guarantee emissions reduction at scale and to generate the revenue that you need to invest in the equity programs that we've been talking about all day. It is, we, we know from our experience with Reggie but that it's something that it works and, what, and it generates the revenue that we need to be able to do the investments that we've been talking about. So that's in part why we want to be focusing this discussion on the investment part of what Cap and Invest can provide. Thank you. Okay, are you envisioning networked geothermal for new smart growth communities or as retrofits? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Of everything that's happening in Massachusetts, there are five or six projects uh, coming online there. That's all retrofits. 
in Vermont, we need new housing. And that, that's the low hanging fruit. That's the easy install for network geothermal. Uh, but we need to do both because network geothermal works for both, works really well for both situations. I, um, I'll let Richard talk about what VGS is doing, but I'm interested in making sure we can prove we can do the retrofits in Vermont and that we can also create more housing and start out that housing on clean, safe, inexpensive energy. So retrofits, as I said before, can be really expensive to do depending on what's happening inside the existing building distribution system. If you have houses or buildings that have forced air, it's a little bit easier to, to retrofit a, a building like that. But I think that the I think the focus on residential new construction or new construction in general where there's where there's multiple buildings to be uh, connected is a really good place to focus because we have to build up the workforce capacity in order to do this work and then scale it. And then we can address a lot of the ret retrofit model. So from a utility point of view, the, the way we can actually build capacity and growth is to focus on the green fields and where there's new housing being built, where systems are being put in for the next generation of, of, uh, of people, of Vermonters. Thank you. How will you overcome the governor's opposition to TCI? I assume that's opposition. That is a, a probably a multi, multi-million dollar question at this particular juncture. What's that, Joey? <laughs> um, and I think it's important to recognize, so for one, I think it's important to recognize that we're not looking solely at TCI. This is looking sort of across a whole variety of cap and invest programs. Um, so lay that out at the outset. You know, I would say in terms of the governor's process and his, his thinking on this, um, you know, as folks may recall, we had included the Transportation Climate Initiative and the Climate Council's uh, most recent climate action plan. Unfortunately, sort of the withdrawal of multiple states ended up really kind of putting that on hold. So there's a multitude of different other vehicles that we can utilize, whether that's the Climate Council proceedings, also moving that through the legislature, offering up enabling legislation. Um, so I think overcoming it is really recognizing just the scale of investment needed to meet our binding climate requirements, and the fact that there's no, there are not many alternative funding mechanisms that will reach that pace and scale that we need to get there. I would just add that this room is a room that can help inform people so that some of that opposition might be overcome. This room is full of people who are knowledgeable and who can be talking about this. Um, to Jordan's point, I think that one of the things that we hope to bring to the table with this pitch is that there's a, a new crop of legislators that are going to come in. 30% of the legislators are going to be new. Many of them probably have never heard about something like cap and invest or a transportation standard, any of those things. It's important that we start um, getting clearer and simpler messaging out there as to what this can do for Vermont to reach its legal requirements in the transportation sector and to invest in equitable clean transportation. This is really one of the only ways to get there. That's why the Climate Council said they wanted to support TCIP. To Jordan's point again, we are not saying that TCIP is the only one. Nova Scotia, which is a small rural territory in Vermont, has joined a cap and invest system. We want to learn from their experience. And I think that the, the governor has some reasonable objections and we need to understand how to respond to those objections in a way that people can understand. And so that's part of what we want to be able to emphasize in this group is the education and outreach part and to be sure that if it doesn't pass this year but it might pass in future years, we lay the groundwork such that it will be successful in the future. You're looking at how it's, 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 it's happening in other states right now, other states that we tend to have similar types of uh, uh, priorities with a Washington, an Oregon, a California, other many other states are considering this now. We need to make sure that we're laying the groundwork so that in the future, whether it's this governor or another governor, we are able to implement something at this scale because it's truly the only way we're going to reach our goals in the transportation sector. 
And just, I think, one closing piece, just recognizing that there are, when you look across WCI, TCIP, um, and the host of other cap and invest programs, you're talking about decades of research and education and outreach that's been conducted to try and get those off the ground. Yes, I will say that there were some flaws in some of those processes, uh, but we definitely want to, want to make sure that all of that time, that effort, that input, and really the very viable vehicles that they put forward aren't left on the table. Okay, a couple more questions. Network ge geothermal across different owners requires high upfront capital costs. How would you finance it? Well, we touched on that a little bit earlier, but just to reiterate, um, I think it's got to have to. It's going to have to be a combination of low-income government loans, which are available, as I said, from the Department of Energy. Uh, apparently, they don't want to cut checks smaller than $500 million, so we better come up with a few projects here in Vermont. <laughs> Great. One back there. Anybody else? Um, uh, so <laughs> the low-interest loans plus some grants, um, that, that is a, a huge hurdle that we need to overcome. VGS will have its own solutions for that, um, but we will overlap in some of the low interest government loans. Um, so in my mind, the investments that we need are out there because there are billions of dollar, federal dollars, as I mentioned earlier, available. Vermont is in the lead. If we have get our applications in soon, I am confident we are gonna get some of that money in our state. And uh, we need to make those kinds of investments rather than other investments that are not going to lower our emissions as effectively as network geothermal can and lower costs as well. I think there's geothermal cooling in here. Everybody feel that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we did, we did touch upon this, but let's, let's just imagine um, all of our permanently affordable housing partners here in Vermont and the, the, the level of pressure to create more housing and also the, the amount of money available to do so. And let's just think about all those um, those buildings going up. So they're going to build these units, these this housing, and so they're going to make that investment in the heating and cooling systems in those buildings. So what's needed is on the geo side is to build the loops. So again, I'll, I'll take the utility perspective because I work for one, but but I actually moved over to VGS because this was a dream that I had about getting utilities involved in geothermal because of the alignment of our investments with energy infrastructure the competency of a workforce to make these investments and then to actually build out these systems. So we can invest in the loops and the developers can invest in the inside appliances and equipment for geothermal. Okay, um, final question, I think, is, the bandwidth of policymakers is limited. Does it make sense to put effort into both a clean transportation standard and a cap and invest? Absolutely does. Um, a couple pieces there. So for one, you know, I'm a, a lot of my background is in conservation and wildlife protection. So I'll use sort of a classic example that I think of the policy making space as being sort of an ecosystem. There are niche species that play very specific roles that support the overall health of an ecosystem. If you look at the climate movement, I think it's the same principle. You have to take multiple different approaches to problems and attack it at all different angles to solve it. Um, also, furthermore, you know, I think a great example of the fact that there is a renewable energy standard and there's, a, there's the regional greenhouse gas initiative. There's a cap and invest program as well as another metric within the state. It's a little bit apples to oranges, but all of this is to say, again, to Linda's point, that these can be very much so complementary programs. And I think furthermore, to actually get a cap and invest program off the ground at this juncture, it's going to take some time. So they're moving on different time frames. Um, they're in different stages of their development, so I think they can both be moved concurrently or, or closely together. Thank you. Thank you. Carl, I just wanted to add one thing. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I, do, I see it as an opportunity. I see it as an opportunity to be able to show to the, the question that you had earlier on what are the pros and cons of either a transportation standard or cap and invest. That's a really good question. And it's one that we can lay out in relatively simple terms. And in fact, some work has already been done at EAN on that. Um, and that's available online right now. Um, but we'd like to carry that forward and again, have this opportunity to help legislators who can't possibly understand all of these things. There's a lot that the legislators do have on their plate. But if we can make it in 
in a simple format that says these are pros and cons, these are how they can work together, this is how other states have made it work, I think that this is an opportunity as opposed to an overload. Okay, thanks to all of our presenters. Give them a round of applause. Okay, so we are going to now have a little bit of time for you to discuss the pitches that you've heard about. And the goal of this is that you, you want to think about, okay, which of these pitches that you just heard best meets the pitch selection criteria that is on page three of your packet? Which might most benefit from a network approach? And maybe are there any of the pitches that you might want to work on? I want to make a quick point that at the end of this conversation, we're going to vote on these four pitches. We're going to rank them, and that's round one of the voting. Uh, round two, we will send the pitches and the videos out to all of our network members and public sector partners, and we'll do another round of voting. You all can vote in that round as well, but we'll invite the people who aren't here today. And then the final decision will be made by our board of directors. So we won't have a final answer on which our pitches, you know, which our network action teams are until sometime in early or mid-October. Um, all right, let's have these conversations. And at, I am going to stop you at about 3.55, so just do about 15 minutes. <laughs>